On Ticker, this is Import Export with Lawrence Christophelts. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Import Export here on TickerTV.com.au. I'm your host, Lawrence Christophelts. Yet again, we've got a fantastic lineup of some um, really interesting guests and industry experts for you on today's show. We've got a whole range of different diverse topics. We're going to talk to Nathaniel Block from FACHI, the French Australia Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We're going to talk to Paul Zalai from the Australian Peak Shippers Association, as well as Paul Barrett, um, one of our, our regular contributors and national partners with AFEX around all the foreign exchange um, roller coasters as well. So a lot, to, lot in store for you to stick around throughout the day, uh, sorry, <laughs> throughout the show, and uh, we'll kick straight into it. So our first guest is Nathaniel Block. Nathaniel Block is a non-executive director of the French Australian Chamber of Commerce and the Industry, and he's also the co-founder and co-host of a, an SBS podcast called Europa Voice. So thanks for joining us, Nathaniel. How are you today? I'm good, Lawrence. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation. No, my pleasure. Look, um, I know you and I have spoken about um, being on the show for a few months now, and I'm really delighted to, to get you on finally. We've had a lot of um, discussions around Asian markets and certain fantastic guests around some of those ASEAN markets and countries. And uh, we've had some, the British Chamber of Commerce, the European Business Chamber, but it's really great to have a, a French perspective on trade, uh, investment, and uh, the broader supply chain between Australia and France as well. So, um, yeah, before we kick off, Nathaniel, maybe for all the viewers, tell us a little bit about FATCHI and the role and how you um, support Australia and, and France, uh, French Australia trade, bilateral trade and investment. Yes, for sure. And so, so the French Australian uh, Chamber of uh, Commerce and Industry is an old organization. It was, in fact, founded in uh, 1899 and wow. at the origin, it was for the import and export of wool only. That was the purpose of the of of, of the FACI at the at the beginning. Uh, now it's an independent, uh, non-for-profit organization with headquarters in Sydney and we have offices all across Australia in Brisbane, Melbourne, Perth, um, and uh, Adelaide. And there are in Australia more than 500 members. Which is important is that the French Australian Chamber of Commerce helps both obviously French companies, but also Australian companies. Um, and it's also affiliated to a broader network of uh, uh, French uh, chambers all around the world, mm -hmm. about 124 uh, uh, chambers in more than uh, 93 uh, countries. So that's that's the big picture of the of, of the FACI. Mm -hmm. And uh, for sure, as every chamber of commerce, the, the FACI has been impacted by COVID-19 yeah. and our goal now, our challenge is try to keep on helping our members and help them navigating through these difficult times of COVID-19. Yeah, fantastic. I think that um, you know many many of us Australians know obviously the fantastic produce and wine and things that come out of France, um, but not many of us know about the infrastructure and some of the, the major projects that, um, uh, that French companies are involved with, not just in here in Victoria, but right across the country. Um, the, those sort of industry sectors, are, uh, France have got some great expertise with, uh, with roads, tolls, trams, all those type of major infrastructure projects. So that's um, a lot of things but that, that, that keep emerging. And as we get, we all start to emerge out of this coronavirus situation, I think uh, even the Premier yesterday here in Victoria talked about the need for major investment in, in continued infrastructure projects and really to get jobs uh, pumping along through that as well. So I can imagine there will be a lot more of uh, trade and, and collaboration investment talks between France and, and Australia in many, many years to come after this emergence of the economies. Yes, Lawrence, you just mentioned the infrastructure and it's, and it's true uh, about infrastructure, in, uh, about the transport, about roads, that there are a lot of reason uh, to be proud to have uh, French companies here in Australia. Just to give you a few names, uh, and I'm sure all the audience has, had already uh, heard about it. There are like there is Transdev, there is a Buick Construction, uh, there is Safran. All these companies, uh, there is Metro Train. All these companies, you know, are well settled in Australia, and they work on very big and important projects for uh, the daily life of Australia. And just give you a few example: uh, the the Westbridge project, um, the Metro uh, and and tram. Uh, in Melbourne, for example, all that uh, you you can find like some big French company. Sometimes they have uh, partnered with Australian uh, big infrastructure companies, 
but they're still working on, on roads, on uh, on bridges, on, on big infrastructure, on, on tunnel, on, on metros. Uh, so yeah, the, the business will, will keep on. And I would say, in fact, that um, what really was a game changer in the French-Australian relationship in terms of cooperation in infrastructure mm. was the big uh, contract uh, signed a few uh, months, few years ago now with uh, the French uh, submarine group Naval. Mm. Uh, it was called the, the contract of the century. Wow. It's uh, a 34 uh, billion euro contract at mm. the time, the million, billion, sorry, uh, uh, Australian dollars contract mm. uh, to build uh, 12 uh, submarines uh, based in Adelaide. So this really was not just a contract about submarines, but it was a contract about cooperation, mm. science cooperation, technological cooperation, uh, supplier cooperation, all these kind of things. And so the movement is in, still increasing. And now our uh, challenge at FACHI is to help uh, all these uh, big cooperation projects to keep on uh, yeah. being and exist uh, after also obviously the, the COVID-19 when things will go back to normal. Absolutely. I think I was going to bring up the defence um, capabilities and, and collaboration. You've beaten me to it. So thank you, Nathaniel. But that does demonstrate the level of um, country cooperation, country trust. I mean, to, there's no bigger trust factor for any country around more, than, more so than their defence force. And so to trust that collaboration and the partnership between Australia and France really goes miles to, to demonstrate that really strong uh, embedded cooperation between the two countries. But also, as you said, infrastructure defence is a lot of synergetic around the broader supply chains between those two sectors. So it's not just the, the end product of the submarine, but how you can co collaborate with all those other input uh, supplies. Uh, you know, you've got your primes in defence, but your subprimes and all the other broader supply chain uh, contributors between those two countries and how that opens up so many more trade and export opportunities. That um, it's a really powerful thing on both of those key sectors, the 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 infrastructure, industrial, defence. I was going to ask you, Nathaniel, what about outside of those those big sectors? And we know the food and wine is always is always a, a very strong one as well. But what other sectors do you see emerging between the two markets, or just in coming out of France, not just in Australia but globally? Other, what about technology? The you know other things that uh, Industry 4.0. What do you see emerging out of uh, future France opportunities? Um, that's a very good question, Lawrence. I think there are like, uh, but it's still related to the, uh, I would say to the defense and infrastructure, but more and more you have, uh, so just to understand in, in, in Australia, you have over 600 French companies here that employ more than 70,000 people. So you have place for everyone. But I would say that if I want to talk about another sector, the tech, uh, the data sector mm. is also um, uh, an object of more and more cooperation between France and Australia. And just in the last uh, month, you, you, you had a couple of uh, French company that settled in Australia or that opened a new office. I just want to mention two of them, Viseo mm. and uh, One Point. Both they are companies that work on, on data, on tech, on, um, on privacy. And I think, you know, all this uh, tech mm. uh, along the infrastructure and along, uh, I would say, the harder uh, industry uh, will be very crucial in the in the French Australian relationship. And I think also, and it's uh, because of what happens with COVID-19, with all the kind of, uh, you know, working remotely, uh, not being able to go necessarily on site, all these things related to data driven uh, uh, sector with tech will keep on also being uh, um, seen as a more an opportunity of uh, cooperating, collaborating between French and Australian companies. Fantastic. Yeah. I think that, uh, as you say, there's, there's so many more um, strings to the bow, if you like, between France and Australia. And that's emerging every, every week, every month. And as we emerge out of this crisis, I think people will really appreciate that technological advancements as well not just around defence infrastructure, but aerospace, um, aviation, logistics. I know there's a lot of French expertise around supply chain, facilitation, distribution, logistics. But I wanted to ask you um, a bit more about the Europa Voice, the SPS uh, podcast yes. that you're doing, Nathaniel. That, that sounds really interesting. Yes. So in fact, we, um, so it's a weekly podcast uh, talking about Europa. Uh, there are several reasons about that. The first one is because we want to um, 
make uh, for the Australian audience understand that now a decision which is taken in France uh, has been necessarily influenced or shaped in a sense by Europe. Mm. Um, just to give you a, a very uh, uh, clear and insightful figure, 80% of French laws are in fact only translation, if I could say, of European laws into the national uh, uh, system. So it means that when Australia needs to deal, needs to partner, needs to do business with France, it has to understand how the laws that regulate France at the moment are shaped by Europe too. So our goal with this podcast is to make the pedagogy of Europe and to explain, in fact, what happens in Europe at the moment. Yeah. Uh, it can be about politics. It's a lot also about uh, economy. One of our first podcasts was about uh, a merger that failed in Europe right. between Alstom and Siemens. Mm. And I'm sure you heard about uh, mm. about it. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of things that we we felt the need to explain for people to understand and to be able to do a better business here. Even if you do business with a country, you have to understand that it's shaped also by Europe. Yeah. And if I just take again the example and the very uh, topical example of COVID-19, yeah. um, obviously every country is independent to uh, a, a shape and to draw the exit strategy, but Europe, uh, European Union has released one week ago um, a joint statement about an exit strategy uh, for COVID-19. Why? Because you can't imagine that every country will be totally independent in the exit strategy because mm. borders are so cold. Yeah. Everything is so ingrained in each other. Mm. So even about COVID-19, even if it's a national decision, the Euro European Union has to, to have a position about what, for example, will be the criteria to be able to implement an efficient exit strategy. Yeah. And Europe, just to give this example, has given three uh, different criteria about epidemiological criteria, you know, yep. uh, mm -hmm. what's the level of, of COVID-19 in the, in the territory, new, new cases or not new cases. The second one is, uh, is uh, the health system and the capability of the health system mm -hmm. sufficient to implement this exit strategy? Mm -hmm. And the third case is the ability to monitor in the future new cases uh, or just people that do not have any symptom. So every country will do what they want, yeah. but Europe has to shape the decision, has to give um, a, a direction, a guideline, because it will have an impact uh, for all European countries. So that's a bit, uh, and sorry, I was a bit long to explain, no, no, that's but that's okay. a bit, uh, that's a no. bit the interest of the podcast is to explain why and how Europe is important even in the uh, bilateral trade between Australia and other countries. No, I love it. I think that um, Australia, we're, we're lucky because we are our own island, if you like, but um, everything that happens in France has a direct impact on Europe as a broader market, as a broader um, continent. So there's, there's definitely a lot of, lot makes so much sense to understand that bigger picture. And the podcast, while people are you know, locked away in isolation, it's great ability for them and opportunity for them to listen to the podcast learning from those experiences like the Alcatel um, failure, type of, the, type of those things where you can, if you're looking at to go into that European market to understand the nuances, the laws, the things that worked, the things that didn't work can, can really make or break your, your market success or even just understand how to do business better with France and French companies will be really powerful. So. Yeah, and, 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 and Lawrence, and also to, to uh, and, and I know you had uh, interviewed a couple of uh, weeks uh, 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 someone from the EABC, the European Australian Chamber of Commerce. That's right. At the moment, there's this framework of the free trade agreement between uh, European Union and Australia. And it's an amazing trade opportunity for yeah. both entities. Obviously, for Australia, it's the access of a 600 million people market, mm. uh, which is the biggest market uh, almost in, in the world. And for France uh, and for Europe, sorry, uh, it's also an opportunity to have a strong presence in the Pacific, yeah. which will be uh, crucial in the following uh, decades, above all with what happens in China. Um, yeah. If I take the French and the European example, uh, everyone is looking also for a way to create a business trade path yeah. that could avoid, I would say, um, uh, Chinese market because you never know because the market can be difficult to access because That's they can right. be closed. So the uh, the fact to have a strong presence in the Pacific yeah. is also very important for Europe, and that's why 
this free trade agreement, which is still into negotiation, there are still rounds of negotiation, mm. is very important. Um, in Europe, we are not used, in fact, to have a lot of uh, free trade agreement because it's a free market, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's why also COVID-19 is quite difficult to understand for people in Europe because that's the first time, in fact, that people are restricted to uh, travel, yeah. uh, goods are restricted to go from one country to another. But yeah. for a country such as Australia, obviously, negotiating free trade agreement uh, is something that you do on, I would say, almost on a daily basis. Great. Thanks, Nathaniel. Look, I really, we've run out of time for this morning, but I'd love to get you back on as those free trade agreements progress further. Obviously, they have taken a little bit of a backseat right now, but um, I really appreciate you coming on the show this morning, finally, and we'll get you on again uh, very soon because those, as those FTA discussions continue to progress, I'd love to get a whole range of new perspectives on that as well. Um, thanks again so much for this morning. We're going to be checking out that podcast and look forward to, to speaking to you again very soon, Nathaniel. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lawrence. Thanks a lot. Great. Um, so you just heard some about um, some really great opportunities that are still emerging between France and Australia. Uh, we're just going to cut to a break and we're coming back very soon with Paul's Live from Australian Peak Shippers Association. So stick around. We'll see you soon. There are now more ways to watch Ticker. Download our apps for Apple and Android devices. We're live on Twitter and YouTube Live. And you can catch us on Amazon Alexa and Google Home. Head to the Ticker website for more. Does your business offer products or services to importers or exporters? Maybe you're a forwarder, broker, lawyer, or even equipment provider. Australian Trade and Logistics Corporation, the industry hub for the nuts and bolts of global trade and logistics. Promote your brand on Australia's only show dedicated to helping importers and exporters grow their businesses globally, smarter and faster. We have a growing niche audience who are your target customers. ATLC has many flexible sponsorship options available. Contact us today to discuss how you too can benefit from our unique ecosystem and community. Drop. On Ticker, this is Import Export with Lawrence Christophels. Welcome back everyone. As you know, with Import Export, um, we will always try to bring you uh, industry voices right across Australia and who have got um, direct access and, and feedback from the market and the key players and stakeholders. So on today's show, we've got Paul Zalai, who looks after the Australian Peak Shippers Association and also uh, looks after FTA as well. So Paul, thanks so much, so much for joining us, mate. It's been um, a great pleasure to get you on the show. Yeah, thanks, Lawrence. It's, it's great to be here. Great. So the Australian Peak Shippers Association, I know that, um, as the name suggests, all the, the big players when it comes to volume of cargo, uh, you represent them through, through your role. Can you tell us a bit more about APSA and how that works throughout the sector and, and the role it plays there? Sure. Um, so the Australian Peak Shippers Association, it's a, it's a not-for-profit uh, industry association um, with a board uh, uh, with a lot of the major exporters on there. Um, they've got about 35 business members in total, as well as supporting other industry associations, uh, including the Australian Meat Industry Council, the Australian Horticulture Export Importer Association, all exporters and the Australian Cotton Shippers Association. So between the group, they collectively, in a good year, weather permitting, uh, export approximately about 600,000 TU. Wow. Um, so pretty major players. Um, we provide the support secretariat for the association mm -hmm. uh, via Freight and Trade Alliance. Yep. So FDA um, was founded eight years ago to be holistic of the across the supply chain and um, since that time, we've grown to be representative of about 380 businesses, primarily with an import focus, yep. representing major importers and freight forwarders and customs brokers. Cool. Um, just very quickly on APSA as well, it's actually um, designated by the Minister for Infrastructure um, uh, and is the designated body to represent both importers and exporters uh, under Part 10 of the Competition and Consumer Act. Right. So we engage with shipping lines when they've got vessel sharing arrangements um, to make sure that they can comply with the Competition and Consumer Act. 
Great. I think that's, you know, it's a really important role that that plays because as we've heard over the last couple of months and even before COVID-19 really sort of had an impact, there was a lot of industry, um, you know, concerns around the port, port charges and all the other infrastructure fees that were creeping in. And I know that, um, you know, I, I read a number of your articles and you're, you're always a strong uh, voice and advocate for the shippers around there. How, how has the, the COVID-19 impacted those peak shippers or just shippers in general, especially importers and exporters? Uh, look, cash, cash flow seems to be the big impediment at the moment. Mm. Um, you know, just uh, passing on, uh, you know, cash down the supply chain is an issue at the best of times, but really sort of highlighted now. Um, you've got me on to one of my favourite topics of the infrastructure surcharge, and I might need <laughs> longer than that the allocated time to do that justice. Um, but look, in summary, our advocacy around that is stevedores charge a, a fee uh, upwards of 80, 90, $120 um, um, at containerized ports around the country. Mm. Um, and re transport operators are at ransom, basically, to pay the fee to get access to deliver and receive car uh, containerized cargo. Mm. So our position all along is we need the stevedores, we need them healthy. We need them to be profitable, but um, we're saying that they need to um, recover their costs off their commercial client being the shipping line, mm. uh, rather than imposing a fee on a third party that has no option but to pay it and, and um, um, you know, to access the terminals. Yeah. So we're, we're actively working with the state government. Uh, Minister Constance, the New South Wales Minister now has come out mm. um, with some quite strong messaging and um, similar in Victoria, Queensland and even WA. So uh, hopefully we get a bit of traction there to just sort of correct the um, the commercial balance there. Yeah, and I think it's, um, as you say, everyone wants to succeed, but for, for every player, transport companies uh, do do it tough. They, it's a really competitive sector and um, yeah, they've got no choice but to pass those on, but uh, they are the meat in the sandwich, as you say. So I think if you look at this whole COVID-19, one of our strong mottos around the country is that we're all in it together. Well, never more so than across the supply chain and trade partners and you know, everyone who plays a, a key role in that infrastructure um, really do have to work together to ensure that everyone gets to the other end of this crisis. So yeah, it's really important, Paul. Um, the other thing I want to ask you as well is, Based on not just these surcharges, what else could the government or should the governments, not just state and federal, what else can they be doing to help um, importers and exporters through the current crisis and even longer term in the future, Paul? What are your thoughts there? Look, there's a whole range of things that, that they've already started and um, things that are sort of a, a work in progress. <clears throat> um, so the schemes that you know everyone in Australian commerce would be familiar with now is the um, the cash flow uh, boost and also the job keeper. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of the and the great great schemes and are going to be vital. Um, where it has its limitations is for the service providers, the customs brokers, and the freight forwarders, um, who outlay huge sums of money uh, on behalf of importers in particular and exporters on um, particularly duty, GST, import processing charges, freight charges, overseas terminal charges and the like. Mm. And they recoup that uh, back generally on a, on a disbursement basis. Um, some account for that as turnover um, and you know it very quickly blows over that $50 million threshold for the cash flow boost. Mm. So we've written to the um, ATO commissioner to get a determination there um, to basically um, get an exemption so that we can meet the intent of the policy there to support SMEs um, in the service provider sector. Similarly, with the JobKeeper scheme, um, you know, you've got to demonstrate a 30% reduction from the previous year. And, um, you know, with air cargo, um, we've got a limit, limited air cargo now because of, of um, you know, we've got no passengers travelling yeah, and 80% of um, air cargo generally came in the belly of passenger aircraft. So uh, a lot of forwarders now are using charters and, and remaining freighters, but the, the prices have gone through the roof, yeah, yeah. again, which is understandable, but it distorts the figure when you're looking at it from an ATO perspective in relation to turnover, that although a, a freight forwarder might have reduced volume um, and reduced uh, 
real turnover. Their actual turnover, if they're including freight disbursements, um, uh, does distort that figure. Yeah. So a couple of things that we're a work in progress there. We're working with our government for the deferral of duty GST and import processing charges. Mm -hmm. uh, immediately, the ATO have been fantastic. Great. And um, they've really worked very closely to improve the deferral of GST scheme. Mm -hmm. So allows importers to very quickly get onto a, a, a monthly scheme. And we've got a few days left uh, before the end of April. So I would encourage importers to have a look at that scheme. Um, for, for this quarter, um, which will give them some instant relief. That scheme used to take up to 30 days to get a registration, yeah. um, but the ATO very much streamlined operations now and, and are turning around applications within three or four days. Great news. Yeah. Um, air cargo funding, um, where you know there was um, big announcements there from the Trade Minister, yeah. um, $110 million supporting the agriculture sector mm. um, and also seafood. Um, meat exporters uh, are benefiting out of uh, well, so that's a work in progress, and we'll yep. be uh, communicating more on that in the uh, coming weeks. Um, but probably, sort of the next level of uh, interest, and it was, this is still a bit of a work in progress for sure. us, yeah. is the um, on the export side of things. We've got a re obviously with a reduction of imports, mm. um, we've got less vessel sailings. Um, and we've got less equipment too, less less containers mm. going to be made available for exporters, and we're struggling to get enough food quality boxes. Yeah. Um, so we're starting to look at it, what what innovations exist there. So if any of your listeners are involved in developing liners for containers yeah. or anything innovative like yeah. that, yep, yeah. um, now could be the time to um to to make yourself known because um. We're, we're going to need to be clever and innovative to keep what is looking to be a quid, pretty good export season with the yeah. agriculture sector um, to keep cargo moving. Yeah, quite right, Paul. I think um, you know, many people overlook that the importance of uh, the repositioning that shipping lines do with all those food quality or reefers or NORs, all those things that uh, are typically taken for granted in many ways. But now, with, as you say, with the sailings not happening, um, we've got to be inventive, be creative. So, yeah, really love the call out and we'll definitely spruik that if there's an opportunity for companies here in Australia who have got container liners or other type of innovation to help provide a, a food grade um, solution. That'd be really great to um, really support that as well. So thanks so much. Um, yeah, you know, look, I think Paul, it's, it's it's a really powerful and important role that uh, that you're playing to really be the voice to government, and really help them to to generate uh, or increase awareness of what the struggles are that uh, importers and exporters are going through. And you know, now I think there's another challenge that I've heard about over the last couple of weeks is the storage part. People's uh, because you can't get end product out to retail. Um, capacity of storage has become an issue where companies, um, this is just uh, hearsay, but I'll, I've, I've heard a lot of people saying the factories are filling up, warehouses are filling up very quickly. Are you hearing the same sort of thing as well? Look, we are, and I suppose we've got the experience um, from the GFC mm. uh, for those of, who have experienced that and, and other similar issues. Um, and that was a big factor then. And um, I think we've been a bit more proactive this time. Yep. Um, particularly been working closely with New South Wales and Victorian uh, Transport for New South Wales and Freight Victoria, um, mm -hmm. who have been fantastic and have really sort of taken the lead on this and looking at all kinds of sites. Um, okay. So um, there are some options being developed and mm -hmm. being promoted in coming days. Yep. Um, one of the big factors, though, which comes back to some of our advocacy, mm -hmm. it'd be great to develop uh, and make available all these sort of staging sites, yeah. um, but coming back to the the statutory import charges, um, if we can't get those charges deferred mm. um, or paid, mm. um, then it doesn't matter what um, staging sites we get, the cargo isn't allowed to leave uh, customs control. Yeah. And uh, we may face a situation where our terminals get congested very quickly. Well, so. Well, um, Sorry, Paul, I was going to also, that's a great point. I wanted to ask you about detention to demurrage. What's happening there? Are there any graces that the carriers or, or what's uh, uh, importers, if they can't obviously get their operations in a typical turnaround time, as we all experience them now, are there, is there any, uh, are they getting any slack cut their way with that situation with detention to demurrage fees? 
Look, we've we've made contact with all the major shipping lines, mm. and um, look again. Understandably, they don't want to make any blanket decision or rulings. Mm. Um, the consensus has been that you know they will look at um, situations on a case by case base. Mm. Um, we've had a couple of scenarios now where we've supported members, and um, and the shipping lines have come to the party, yeah. uh, particularly around um, the disruption at Hutchison Ports mm. um, in Port Botany, where they um, some staff. There was some dispute over a COVID situation yeah. there and the terminal was closed for a week. Mm. So we had some um, serious um, issues there with stranded containers, but the shipping lines were very accommodating and understanding of the unique situation. So, so look, we're hopeful that that, as you said at the beginning, the, the, the need for um, cooperation will continue, but um, so far so good. Great. Thanks so much, Paul, for joining us today. It's been a great pleasure to have you on and, and um, you know, really, again, look forward to all your contribution to, to being that voice of those peak shippers to, to government and to industry and, and to really help navigate all of us through this crisis. So um, thanks, mate. Really appreciate you joining and look forward to chatting again very soon. Thanks again, Lawrence. Thanks, Paul. So, um, so coming up after the break, we've got uh, Paul Barrett from AFX to talk all things currency and where, that, where, where that's going with this roller coaster as well. So stick around, we'll see you very soon. There are now more ways to watch Ticker. Download our apps for Apple and Android devices. We're live on Twitter and YouTube Live. And you can catch us on Amazon Alexa and Google Home. Head to the Ticker website for more. Do your association members want to improve their global trade and supply chain skills? ATLC can work with you to design and deliver group training and workshops specific to your industry sector. Leverage our expertise to help your members grow globally faster. Our global networks can open up a world of new market opportunities for your members. We regularly work with overseas trade agencies to support inbound and outbound delegations too. ATLC has the programs your industry association needs. Contact us to discuss your association's trade and supply chain goals. Does your business offer products or services to importers or exporters? Maybe you're a forwarder, broker, lawyer or even equipment provider. Australian Trade and Logistics Corporation. The industry hub for the nuts and bolts of global trade and logistics. Promote your brand on Australia's only show dedicated to helping importers and exporters grow their businesses globally, smarter and faster. We have a growing niche audience who are your target customers. ATLC has many flexible sponsorship options available. Contact us today to discuss how you too can benefit from our unique ecosystem and community. On Ticker, this is Import Export with Lawrence Christophels. Welcome back everyone. You're watching Import Export here on TickerTV.com.au. I'm your host, Lawrence Christophels. Well, I'm really delighted to say I've finally got someone in studio with me for a change, which is a real um, <laughs> breath of fresh air. It's, it's good to have someone in the flesh. Thanks for joining me, Paul. Uh, pleasure, LC. It's uh, good to uh, good to see you, albeit at a uh, government endorsed distance. Yeah, we're doing the distancing thing. So yeah, uh, yeah that's nice to uh, get out and about from uh, from the house and uh, and just try and uh, you know get a bit of fresh air and stuff like that. So. Yeah, I've been watching you know the the clips that you've been posting the 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 Monday Friday clips and you know you did brighten up our day with the fluoro orange shirt. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's a uh, a beautiful orange shirt. Uh, care of marketing. So I think it was a. Uh, a running shirt uh, back in the day from a fundraiser and um, you know we uh, we found it and I thought uh, you know I need something and didn't necessarily want to put on the the business shirt uh, <laughs> sitting in the bedroom so I'm like oh actually I think I might go with the fluorescent uh, orange shirt just to get a, a something a bit striking out there so um, you know I think marketing was quite happy with it yeah. uh, Kat said how much it sort of shone on camera I said uh, 
probably need my sunglasses though. I was going to say, that, definitely, right, so. it was a good wake up for a lot of people on a Monday morning. <laughs> yeah, it certainly, I guess, does uh, does attract some attention. But uh, as you said, you know, on the uh, the bi-weekly video blog that yeah. uh, that I've been doing, just to sort of go through some of those key points yeah. um, in the market at the moment. Obviously, you know, there's so much happening with uh, with the Aussie. Um, usually, the question is, is what is happening? Yeah. Um, but uh, at this stage, it's almost you know, sort of what's not happening. So, well, yeah, that's what I want to ask Paul. I mean, for for the viewers who haven't seen Paul before, um, and many of you have seen Paul with all of our, our live events that we've all had to put on hold now um, due to COVID. But Paul is uh, the Apex expert here in Victoria, and, and Apex are proud partners of the Australian Trade Logistics Corporation. They are the Forex experts. So the reason why you know it's so important to have you on the show and great again in the flesh is to people are, are, are flooded with uncertainty at the moment, and Forex is always uncertain. So you've lived this you know your whole career in Forex, but yep. um, how have you found what's what's going on, and I'll, you know what's really happened with the Aussie dollar? I know it's you know how long is a piece of string type question but yep. what are your your thoughts on that yeah i mean i think um you know everyone sort of had seen what had happened with the australian dollar obviously it had a uh, an 18 month downtrend you know doing a lot of this on the back of uh, the us and the china trade wars which you know i guess given the the current environment you know i think a lot of people albeit at the time they were sick of hearing about the us china trade wars you'd yeah. almost want to hear about it right now versus <laughs> the uh COVID-19 or the coronavirus, which you uh, obviously hear, you know, however many seconds per day. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's that's obviously been a big suppression in terms of the AUD previously, which a lot of people know. Um, and then as we got to sort of that 68 level and the, and the coronavirus started really breaking out, obviously there were there were some impacts, um, initially failed a lot within the, the supply chain. Um, you know, uh, China was basically locked down. Yeah. Um, people couldn't get supply. and. We saw a lot of that across uh, our book and our, our clients, you know, a lot of conversations there about how hard it was to, you know, that orders sort of stacking up to here, you know, trying to, to get stock across. Yeah. And, you know, I think at the time there was a lot of complacency. I don't know, you know I don't want to get into conspiracy theories and there's obviously a lot of government chat about yeah. how much, uh, you know, China may have covered up, how bad the, the actual extent of the virus was. But, you know, I don't think anyone in their wildest dreams figured that it was a virus that could, you know, get to a lot of the, the rest of the countries yeah. um, and certainly not at that scale. Mm. And, you know, everyone, you know, sort of largely being stuck at home in a, in a massive lockdown. And, you know, you've even got places, you know, like India and Singapore where a lot of the supply chains closed mm. down as well. So um, obviously the reaction to a lot of that breaking out, especially America and Europe, um, getting a large amount of the virus. Yeah. Um, you know, we saw the Aussie, you know, wasn't quite a, a flash crash because it was probably a little bit more prolonged than that. But, yeah. um, you know, it went all the way down and, uh, and very quickly hit that sort of 55, 10 yeah. level. Um, you know, we've obviously bounced back from there where, you know, sort of sitting around that, that between 63 and 64 level at the moment. So, you know, it feels like it's, it's largely done a little bit of that mm. recovery. Obviously, mm. you know, sort of 55, 10, that reaction seemed a little bit overcooked on, on fear as, you know, yeah. fear tends, tends to breed fear. So it leads to sort of further selling and risk off. So we obviously went through that phase. That was that, you know, initial reactionary phase, you know, quite scary and, you know, um, you know a lot of very much uncertainty in terms of the market. Yep. Um, you know, we've sort of got through that. We've obviously had a lot of government stimulus uh, which has been propping up a lot of things, been propping up risk, which yep. is, you know, Aussie is very much tied to to risk on sentiment. So a lot of that's, you know, sort of been part of that recovery. We've obviously seen, you know, a lot of those bailout packages and just the, oh, yeah, I was the ask, amazing, yeah. uh, I guess, you know, figures and, and sums that have been sort of thrown around and we're still going through that a lot now. The US was green lighting another sort of $500 billion package <laughs> to again prop up small business. Yeah. So. Um, you know, and I referenced this on the video blog the mm. other day that, you know, that 63 level where we are now, it very much feels like, um, you know, we're in a bit of a, an, a high of the storm. Yep. Um, you know, I think the Aussie was largely trading on sentiment from the coronavirus. We obviously saw that massive reaction down to 55, 55 yeah. and then sort of slowly sort of eked its way back up to 63. So, you know, I guess my sort of thoughts based on, you know, all the data inputs and, and everything else that you see within the news is that, um, you know, the, the market's starting to sort of evolve from that, yeah. um, that flu sentiment. So, you know, previously, obviously, you know, the sun is shining, everyone's out of lockdown, productivity's back, um, we're straight back to BAU, yeah. we're straight back to, you know, jobs mm. and, you know, economic growth. And I think, you know, the market's now starting to get to a point where it's like, okay, 
you know, even if America and Europe come out of lockdown, yeah. um, you know, let's look past that. It's what, gonna be. What does that look yeah. like now? Yeah. Um, and, you know, CPI and a lot of other sort of key data points are obviously gonna be affected over the next coming months. But I guess one of the, the key ones that I've been looking at is that unemployment rate and yeah. the, uh, the jobless claims figures, um, you know, US, the figures are mind blowing. It's, you know, sort of adding anywhere between four and six million wow. um, unemployment yeah, claims it's, it's, or jobless claims per week, yeah. which, you know, absolutely blows the mind. So we're at 22 million over four weeks mm. and uh, very quickly, you know, potential for, for 30 million and that release is out uh, tonight in terms of that update. Really? And, well, you know, same thing with Australia. Um, you know, we had Governor Lowe come out yesterday and basically predict a 10% unemployment rate and those figures have obviously been skewed with the job keeper yep. um, incentive. So there's yep. a little bit of sort of wallpaper, I guess, that's that's right. at risk yeah. at the moment. Yep. Um, but even uh, he was, you know, confident for, for lack of a better term that, you know, unemployment could be uh, 10% and, you know, BAU in terms of activity and growth may mm. not return until September. So that's right. And that, that's the thing, Paul. I mean, these are unprecedented times in every sense of the word. When it comes to those drivers of what fluctuates, what's causing the fluctuations in the currency. This all could change you know, every week, every month, as things evolve, people could go backwards or countries could get another breakout or second wave of yeah, COVID. Yeah, Singapore. Exactly, so there's so many unknowns. And one of the things, I mean, you know, I know we sound like a scratch record when we talk about this, but any business, in even the best of times, you need to have strong cash flow, you need to have minimal risk. And it really surprises me and, and, and really frustrates me, and I know it does with you too, is that companies don't spend enough time really building a forex strategy, because you know they think, oh yeah, well look, I've got my cash flow forecast, I've got my my loan accounts, got all these service providers with 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 my typical day to day cash flow, but then the impact for importers and exporters on forex is just it's massive. So, how have you found through this crisis? And I know it's a it's a bigger impact, but how well prepared have companies been in your experience or are you getting all those phone calls thinking paul mate i know you told me this last month but is it too late can i jump in now you know what do you what have you lived over the last month or so yeah i mean you know let's call a, a spade a spade a pandemic it's a pandemic so you <laughs> yeah. know we'll give you know obviously a lot of people in uh, you know executive financial positions the the bailout there because you know you can't prepare for, no. for something of this scale and you know, even on our side of the fence, you know, we live it, we breathe it day in, day out, 24 seven, you know, none of us predicted a, a 55 as a, mm. as a bottom level, as we said, you know, mm. fear promotes fear. So you can't, you can't cover a lot of those sort of bases. I guess what you'll, you'll tend to find in a lot of conversations that I have, and obviously, as you would know, you know, do a lot of networking and, and just having those different conversations, doesn't matter which industry it is. Yeah. There's, um, you know, I guess a decent amount of complacency with a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, different businesses and different areas. Um, you know, it seems obviously um, especially uh, prudent with with importers. They obviously, mm. you know, seem to be quite um, positive uh, in terms of sentiment. So there's always that. Oh, we're at 63 now, so let's just wait until we get to 70 and stuff yeah. like that. Um, you know, it's about flipping that uh, that conversation. And, you know, I always do it with, you know, people that I chat to and, and with client base as well, just in terms of, yep, we know it's markets, obviously things could go up, you could get a, a theoretically more beneficial rate, but, you know, the number one non-negotiable is to work on what you can't afford to happen. Yeah, and that's... I think that is something that is largely missing with a lot of businesses. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of businesses have unfortunately been found wanting um, on the back of the pandemic because, you know, yes, we've covered some of the bases, yeah. we've got some risk covered, but I also want to have sort of an open side to, you know, you know, when the Ooh. when the Aussie rallies a whole heap. Yeah. But if you're not covering the non-negotiables for the business, and mind you, there's strategies that will allow, um, you know, for a little bit of that balancing act anyway. That's what I'm referring to there, Paul, is that, yes, I mean, no one can prepare for a pandemic. I mean, no. governments, hospitals, no matter what. But from business as usual, and Australians are very complacent when it comes to Forex compared to other importers and exporters around the globe, like we had Nathaniel um, from Fachi on the show, as you, as you saw this morning, you know, European countries, European companies, American companies, Asian countries, they, they really spend time investing in Forex strategies. Australians, for some reason, we're sort of like, yeah, she'll be right, we'll, we'll be it right. Is, it's, that, and it's crazy. It's that Australian mentality, yeah. she'll be right, mate, I guess is yeah. always the one that's sort of referenced. And yeah. it's, it's very much like that, you know, it's, you know, and it's been happening for, I guess, generations. Mm. I've even heard of, you know, stories from my old man's generation of, you know, sales teams sort of excited about the, the new contracts that they've yeah. just built. And, 
you know, all of a sudden the, the finance team kind of has that, uh, you know, white look in the face and goes, yeah. oh, sorry, I didn't cover uh, FX risk. So yeah. everything you've just sold, we're now going to cover at a loss. So, yeah. um, you know, and it, it very much is, it's, you know, obviously FX seems to be one of those areas where, um, you know, a lot of people and not everyone. And obviously, you know, a lot of the times it does vary on uh, the size of business. Yeah. Obviously the big end of town usually mm. cover themselves quite well and have a lot of the, the key staff to sort of go through it. But certainly that, that um, you know, that middle sort of corporate area is yeah. one where, you know, it's, well, our strategy is I saw the rates in the paper. Um, I've got a cost rate. Mm. So as long as that's, you know, wholesale rate or, you know, our dealing rate stays above, um, you know, that cost rate, yeah. then we've got some we flexibility, fine. we're fine for now. But so, that, and you know, a lot of people, when we dipped under 70, yeah. got caught out, you yeah. know, it was always, well, you know, the Aussie has been bouncing off 70. So yeah. we just continue to sort of see that behavior. Mm. Mm. And, you know, you only need to look at the last sort of three to four weeks, the yeah. market yeah. is, you know, and an organic, yeah. you know, sort of biomechanical, uh, you know, uh, reaction to it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, but, uh, but that's the thing, Paul, I mean, like, as I said, pandemic off the charts, no one can predict it, but everything always happens. I mean, we've yeah. had the Ch US China trade war, we have Brexit, we have all these things that happen even in the last six months yeah. that have just taken place that yeah, all that's impact. Just the, that's just the last 12 days. Exactly. Months alone, right. so. so that's even if we take the pandemic off the table yeah. and companies still don't learn from these mistakes. So one of my hopes is, and one of the things that we'd, we've talked about over the last uh, multiple weeks on this show, is that how can companies better prepare for the re-emergence of their business, yep. of their economy, as importers, exporters, how can they be, be, be better importers and exporters, better supply chain, um, how can they improve all that? One of the really critical ways to do that is to, to wake up, speak to some Forex experts and say, okay, let's look at your business, where it has been, no one knows, how do you want it to protect yourself in the future? Yep. And yeah, that's, that's a really important part of having specialists. The, the whole theme that I've seen coming through international trade supply chain for the companies who do it well, they get the experts on. They don't try and be everything. And to you everyone. outsource risk to That's a large it. degree. Yep, yeah. don't get me wrong. The bottom line still is with you. It's on your yeah. side of the fence. But, you know, when you've got a CFO or a, you know, finance executive or a CEO, you know, yeah. you've got, you know, you're juggling the basket. You've got, you know, 400 different things that you've got to take care of. Mm. And, you know, FX is always, um, you know, and FX risk is one of those ones that, you know, it's kind of, you know, in good times, you know, we might just sort of trade a little bit yeah. straighter and obviously not with huge fluctu fluctuations that it's, you know, we're fine, we're, you know, I feel like that's kind of covered, mm. we've got a loose form of a strategy, let's move on to something else, yeah. something more important, so to speak, to, um, you know, in terms of sales generation and, and revenue side, but like I've always said, there's no point in tripling your sales if when you get it back to the bottom line, there's no margin there. So, exactly, yeah. And, but, and that's the thing, and it's, you know, you need to empower and, uh, and outsource risk because, you know, as I said, we deal with it 24-7, you know, we understand the markets, you know, obviously we can't, you know, give guidance in terms no. of where it's going to yeah. go because even at the moment, you know, could hit 70, <laughs> could hit 55 again. Exactly. But it's looking at what are the risks that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what what is, you know, sort of coming out in terms of the market. Everything we do is just analyzing that risk yeah. and then, you know, working that and back building to the your business strategy and saying, around that. Yeah. if this happens, let's work on worst case scenario because that always has a possibility. Yeah. Yep, cool, best case scenario, if this happens, let's do this yeah. but more importantly if this happens can you afford for that to happen what happens to your business if this does occur yeah. and it's i guess getting some of that awareness for people to think a little bit more not be pessimistic but just be a little prepared. bit more alarmed yeah. and prepared yeah. and you know i guess it'd be interesting on the back of the virus that you know it doesn't matter if it's fx doesn't matter if it's it infrastructure e-commerce for for retailers yeah. Um, you know, is this the wake up call that a lot of people need to, yeah. to go and finally, not eliminate because that's hard to do, but cover address a lot it. of that yeah. risk, yeah. address a lot of that yeah. risk and not leave these open ends right. in key facets of your business. Thanks, Paul. Look, stick around. Uh, we've got to go to a break, but we're going to come back and wrap up and definitely some, um, touch on some of those quick points you mentioned there. So uh, stick around. Paul will join me just for a final wrap up after this short message. Thanks very much. There are now more ways to watch Ticker. Download our apps for Apple and Android devices. We're live on Twitter and YouTube Live. And you can catch us on Amazon Alexa and Google Home. Head to the Ticker website for more. Have your products, warehousing or distribution requirements changed in the past 12 to 24 months? There's a reason the world's best companies regularly tender their supply chain services. 
Professional tender management ensures you're getting the best pricing and solutions available for your business. ATLC delivers customised tender management programmes for freight forwarding, warehousing and distribution services. ATLC's programmes deliver real and measurable results by only inviting suitable service providers to compete for your business. Simply tell us about your specific business needs. We design and manage the entire process for you. ATLC goes to market and does all the work However, you get to make the final independent awarding decisions. Contact us today and we'll help you get the most out of your supply chain partners. Do your association members want to improve their global trade and supply chain skills? ATLC can work with you to design and deliver group training and workshops specific to your industry sector. Leverage our expertise to help your members grow globally faster. Our global networks can open up a world of new market opportunities for your members. We regularly work with overseas trade agencies to support inbound and outbound delegations too. ATLC has the programs your industry association needs. Contact us to discuss your association's trade and supply chain goals. Drop into Tech and Newsroom. The biggest opinions, the news, and what you need to know. And I'll be bringing you all the crazy moves from Canberra, live, right here, every day. We want to bring you breaking news now. The analysis you won't hear anywhere else. Because Ticker is bold business, a brand new era for news. Search Ticker TV on the web, on the app stores, or on social media to find us. On Ticker, this is Import and Export with Lawrence Christophelts. Welcome back everyone. You're watching Import Export here on TicketTV.com.au. I'm your host, Lawrence Christophels. We've had a fantastic show today. We've had Nathaniel Block from FACHI, the French Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, talking about all these amazing opportunities and things that are happening between Australia and France, defence, infrastructure, a whole range of new projects that are still going to create major growth and major job opportunities and broader supply chain opportunities for years to come. We've had Paul Zalai from Australian Peak Shippers Association really giving his insight around how those peak shippers, importers and exporters have been coping with these challenges for COVID-19 and beyond. And now I've still joined the studio with Paul Barrett from Apex around all the foreign exchange specialty expertise and skills and why it's so important to really prepare yourself as we emerge out of this. So just before we wrap up on today's show, um, a really quick reminder, we've got a, an amazing webinar. We had uh, the Quinton McCauley from Network Steadfast on our show last week, and we've got a, a really important trade and business risk webinar coming up at midday today. So you've still got time to actually sign up. It's a free webinar, it goes for an hour, and some of the stuff that you need to understand about protecting your risk, de-risking the business so that you can succeed and survive these times, it's more important than ever. So jump on the Australian Trade Logistics Corporation.com.au website, register for free. It's happening today, midday for one hour. Check it out, you won't be disappointed. Now coming up in two weeks time, we've got another really important webinar on the 7th of May. That's all around modern slavery reporting across your supply chain. So many of you as importers and exporters haven't prepared um, and you're going to really be found out very quickly because there's a deadline looming 30th of June here in Australia to report on your modern slavery compliance for your supply chain. So check that out 30th of May. Again, register on the, on the site for that webinar. And finally, um, just to wrap up, we talked about this last week. I am going to be like a scratch record and keep saying it. You need to take this opportunity while things are quiet in your lockdown, um, re-strategize your business, review your supply chain, review your service providers, Get out there, speak to experts, and get your partners all lined up. So 
If you need to go to tender management, we can help you with that. If you want to find introductions to the experts in the sector, like Paul and like the others that we can offer, uh, introduce you to through ATLC, get in touch with us. Now's the time. You've got to really get, give yourself a really clean slate and give yourself every chance to succeed, survive and grow as we emerge out of this. So thanks so much for your time again today. Hope you've enjoyed today's show. We're going to have another great episode coming up next, next Thursday. Hopefully we'll see you on the webinar at midday today. Take care. Have a great week. Cheers. There are now more ways to watch Ticker. Download our apps for Apple and Android devices. We're live on Twitter and YouTube Live. And you can catch us on Amazon Alexa and Google Home. Head to the Ticker website for more.